Good afternoon, everybody, or good morning, or very late evening, wherever you're listening from. Nice international crowd, as usual. Uh, thanks for joining uh, today's webinar. And uh, today is about shooting tethered with the Fujifilm X-T4 and Capture One and Wayne Johns, who we'll introduce uh, in a second. Um, before we get to that, a few housekeeping things. So we're streaming into our webinar room. So welcome to those uh, listening in the webinar as well. Uh, we're also going out to Facebook and we're also going out to YouTube. So three at the same time. So uh, to those of you on Facebook and YouTube, welcome as well. There is rather a lot of you. So we will try and navigate the questions as best we can. Uh, but please don't be disappointed if we don't get to uh, your particular question. Uh, a few other housekeeping things to talk about. Uh, so the maximum time we run today is around 60 minutes. Uh, we shall try to keep to that. We are recording the webinar. If you're watching on Facebook, then it just appears immediately on Facebook once uh, it's finished. Uh, for those of you who are in the webinar room itself, if you want to ask a question, we're discuss that in a second and um, those of you on Facebook and YouTube just put it in the comments and again we do our best to see everything and of course enjoy chatting with each other as well now if you're in the webinar room the chat tab which you found is the good public place to discuss chat heckle and talk uh, with each other if you want to ask a question it's best to put it in the specific Q&A tab because then it doesn't get lost uh, in the chat um, itself. As I said, for those of you on Facebook and YouTube, uh, just pop your question in the comments and we do our best to have a look at those as well. Um, now, if uh, chatting and questions in the webinar are not interesting, or indeed on Facebook and YouTube, you can hide all of those as well. So let us begin. Right, let's go and find Wayne. Wayne, you should be on screen now. Hey. How's it going? I'm good, good, thank you. Good, good, so, good. Uh, Wayne, uh, perhaps before we dive into what we're going to do today, Wayne, if you could just give us the 30 second intro on who, what you are, et cetera, et cetera. <laughs> what I am. <laughs> what, yeah. <laughs> uh, well, obviously, people have tuned in, so they know my name, Wayne Johns. Uh, I'm a fashion, beauty, and advertising photographer based over here in the UK. Uh, on top of that, my, my career has spanned about 25 years plus in this mm -hmm. industry. Um, and I'm lucky enough to be a Fujifilm um, ex-photographer or Fujifilm ambassador, right. um, if you want to call it that. Yes. Um, and today, uh, now, as you said, you're a fashion and beauty photographer. That's obviously mm, yeah. been a little bit difficult to <laughs> do that over the past uh, few weeks. Um, and yes. I remember when we originally planned this quite some months ago, we were actually going to do a fashion uh, and beauty uh, shoot. Yes. Now, obviously, uh, you couldn't do that. <laughs> <laughs> not, not during current no. lockdown times. No. no, exactly. So as a as a backup, uh, <laughs> you dragged a family member kicking and screaming into the studio, correct? Uh, yeah. To, to do what we needed to do today. Indeed, yeah. And yeah. it's so far removed from what I normally shoot as well. Um, and uh, it's been, been a trying situation as well. Yeah. Um, I've pulled in a, uh, a lovely supermodel daughter of mine Excellent. who's um, five years old. So. <laughs> perfect perfect but we um, we make do with what we have don't we so. yes and the we, good we news is me. you did manage to get hold of an xt4 so otherwise yes. that would have been uh slightly challenging if we didn't have one of those and you shot tethered <laughs> into a uh, capture one I um, did. <laughs> and uh and we've got the full workflow that we can show you um as well now because yeah. we we couldn't sort of pull off again the idea was that we could be in the same studio we could mm -hmm. show you on camera the setup and all that kind of stuff. And of yep. course, that wasn't really a sensible thing to do. Uh, no. So what we've done is we've shot some, uh, or sorry, I shouldn't say we, I should say Wayne has shot <laughs> some pre-roll information uh, yep. for us to watch. So we've got three video clips, which we're going to roll throughout the webinar. Uh, yep. So we've got your lighting set up, correct? Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, we've got your connection settings um, and we've got some BTS as well of the actual shoot. Tiny little bit. Yeah. Yeah. So they're just like one or one or two minutes, uh, if yeah. that, uh, just to kind of get round the fact that we can't be together, which is very yeah. sad. Yeah, okay. it's not very long. They're just little snippets and exactly. we don't want to take up too much time with with those. But they are like just just little general coverage areas and uh, Nice. Just a, a snip, sneak preview. Cool. So I'm going to run the first one, which is about the lighting setup. Now, this is also the first time we've ran a clip 
within a webinar. So fingers crossed it actually works. <laughs> Watch this space. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Watch this space indeed. So the first one we're going to uh, roll is the lighting setup and then we'll yep. be back again in a minute or so. Okay? Yeah. Great. Okay. So to give you an idea of my setup, I'm going to be shooting with the XF35 1.4 lens and also the 56 f1.2 lens just because of the space we're in. I'm not going to shoot a full portrait. I'm going to shoot either a half or a, a three quarter at most. Now my lighting setup is very simple. To my right here or to camera left, I've got a 150 centimeter umbrella softbox, which is white on the inside with a double diffusion layer to give me extra soft light. And that's in front of my subject and just feathering across so I don't get a hot spot. Uh, behind camera, I've got an Octa 90 umbrella softbox, um, which is just on very low power, giving me very gentle feel for the darkest of the shadow areas so I don't lose that in my shot. And then behind me, you can see another light on the stand, which is giving me a bit of a, a streak, a ray of light, like a bit, a bit of a window streak or sunlight streaking down the background. There are barn doors on there, but I've also got a Fresnel lensed head in there as well, just to uh, give, give me a bit more light effect. And that's it. Simple as that. Great. We're back, Wayne. That worked. Ah, perfect. <laughs> perfect. Perfect. So um, I can't remember the clip myself now. <laughs> so that was just. I didn't get to see any of that. Sort of no, you didn't. You just you just have to trust me, Wayne. Um, so yeah, that was just um, you had the lighting diagram, if you remember. Uh, yeah, perfect. So, so which yeah. just uh, showed your daughter and the, the various different uh, bits and pieces as as well. Yeah. Yeah. Obviously, to let people know, I'm in my home studio space for this as well. So I'm not in a normal studio. So we are restricted on space and things as well. Exactly. Um, and obviously, I'm shooting this as a fine art portrait. So a little bit different, obviously, with a with a challenging five-year-old. But yeah. <laughs> <laughs> words, can you stay still? Will haunt me forever. <laughs> I'm, I'm just going to um, throw out a question because this is about mm -hmm. the X-T4 as well. So Carl was okay. asking. Uh, what's the performance of the X-T4 like in low light? Because I, I haven't tried one yet myself. Um, so I know you've had the chance to play with it a little bit. So Yeah. Yeah, yeah I mean, it, it's it's really nice. It's really good. I mean, the X-T3, I think, was leaps and bounds ahead of X-T2 in terms yeah. of low light capabilities and um, focusing and the speed. So if you if you just take the performance of the X-T3 and put it on some steroids, then you're you're going to be up with the X-T4. Everything's a bit faster in the X-T4 um, in every respect, really. So mm -hmm. yeah, it, it works well. Works well. So quick. That's good. And, and we're going to talk about um, connection settings next. Uh, yes. We've got another clip to roll with that as as well. Now, in terms of tethering to Capture One, you obviously shoot tethered with your. Yes. What do you have a GFX? Um, I shoot XT series and GFX series, so I shoot the medium format a, a lot as well in my in my industry, in my career, so yeah. in my work rather. Um, and it's pretty much the same with any Fuji camera. You have to sort of go through and change this. I will make a little correction to that video clip as well because there's a bit I forgot to add in there, but because um, okay. it does sound a bit wrong when I hear it back. But, uh, <laughs> but it, yeah, it is right. But there's another regardless thing you need to of add what, on to that. <laughs> what Fuji camera you have, the process is is similar. Now there was a question yeah. from Pavel about. Um, supporting the X100F or the X100V. So if you go to Capturon's website, you can see which cameras are compatible, whether for file support or for um, tethering support. Now, whether they are supported tethered or not is, is actually a Fujifilm decision. Uh, mm -hmm. So whether you know it works or it doesn't work, that's, that's down to Fujifilm. So if there's a particular camera uh, that you want to work within Capture One, then Fuji are the guys to lobby as well. So we're just, we just do as we're told. <laughs> cool. So I'm going to roll the little VT clip about uh, connection settings as well. Yes. Okay. Okay, perfect. So before we dive into shooting, we have to change one setting in the camera for tethered shooting. So let's have a little look in the menu. We'll just go in and change that now. Uh, and then the tether will be ready to go into Capture One. That's just to tell the camera that we're shooting, the images are being tethered and they're being recorded. Uh, outside of the camera system and not on the memory card, that's all. So the first thing we want to do is go into your camera's main menu and then just scroll all the way down to your spanner and then come across and go down to connection setting. Once you get into there, just scroll all the way down to connection mode and natively it is set to USB card where it records to your SD card and we just want to change that to either USB tether shooting auto or USB tether shooting fixed. Um, I leave it on auto and that means when you unplug it goes back to recording to your card. 
Now, one thing you must remember to do after you finish tether tuning is go into the menu and change that back to USB card, or your camera will always be looking for a tether connection to save your image to and it won't save to your SD card. Once you've got that changed over to USB tether shooting auto, uh, we're ready to go into the shoot. Alrighty, we're back, Wayne. Um, Perfect. Little question, timely question from Daniel. That was on from Facebook. Oh, we're yep. just covering up our faces with Daniel's comment. Let's move that. <laughs> what tethering cable is used for connection to a MacBook or a PC? Yeah, I mean, I know there's tether tools. They're probably a brand that everybody knows. Um, <laughs> But political personally, I just find them very expensive, mm -hmm. and um, in in past experience, not always as reliable as they should be for the price. So um, I go to a different electronics company over here that actually sells a cable that looks very much the same right. as a uh, Tether Tools one, but a different color um, for about forty pounds less. Right, and that's just um, USB on the XT series, isn't yeah, it? X yeah, XT3 is USB C. Yeah, so oh, nice. we've got USB C now, um, and then. Um, I go through um, another three or five meter um, passive extender if right. I've got a long tether cable just to keep the power in the in the connection. Got it. I use it for medium format too. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I guess with USB C, uh, the the limitation is around three meters or something like that, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. and it's just worth having a passive um, extender because you know you you don't want the power drop to affect a shoot when you're in mid flow, especially commercially anyway. Yeah. No, exactly, exactly. Um, oh, a non-related question from Gaston. Yes. What was the Studio Light software you used to make the, the lighting diagram? Uh, that was called Satellite 3D. Yep. Um, you can go in and buy a, a basic version or a pro version. Um, it gives you those attachments and things. It is very good, actually. So if you're new to lighting, you can go in and play with different lights and modifiers. And move it around and change their power and change your models and their clothing and their positions cool. and their height and backgrounds and props and everything um, and then you can learn a bit of light before you actually set up the light so to speak very nice um what was the question i was going to ask mine went blank um uh, is it about the usb tether clip uh we can answer that too but you said there was yeah. something in the video that you wanted to correct as correct as well. yeah we'll just yeah. add on to because in, in the video i said that make sure if you're not going to tether shoot that you go back into your camera menu and change that back to um sd you know usb uh, to uh, sd card for right. your for your shooting um if you're in usb auto the camera will already know that you're not tethered and will automatically go back to card but right. if you're in usb fixed it means it's a fixed tether connection. So if you go in USB fixed and then you unplug a tether and then go and try and shoot with your camera, it won't record again any images to your card uh, unless you change it back to card. Right. All right. So it's just that little add-on to that one. <laughs> <laughs> um, Adam on YouTube said, I'm just going to put up the name Satellite 3D. That was the one, yes. wasn't it? Yeah. So yeah. I'll just pop that on screen. So. Uh, people can see it. Very cool. Um, okay, so I'm just going to put up on the screen the final shots <coughs> that you created, and then we have a look yes. at the. Now I've got a feeling this might mute us when I put it up. One second. Uh, <laughs> nope, we're still live. So I've got up on screen the two final versions that you ended up with. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So so you've got like a warmer look and a and a colder look. Yeah, the warmer look yeah. is like a typical baroque style sort of, you know. Um, warmth and tone um, yeah. but I've actually done this initial shoot and set up with the cooler look to begin with I've just given the warmer look as a variant as, a, as an option yeah as, a, as an option color obviously those two variants have actually been done in Photoshop as an edition right um, or the warmer one has been done in Photoshop as an edition the cooler one's been done in capture one yeah cool fantastic all right so the last clip we're going to roll is the BTS so people get an idea of the, the shot and then we can switch to capture one and show the yep. editing workflow. Okay. Cool. Nice. Perfect. All right. Let's roll VT as they say. <laughs> <laughs> Beautiful. Good. Here we go. That's it. Nice straight neck. Nice and straight for him. Good. Then chin down a touch. Beautiful. And then turn your head to those hands. Good. Beautiful. In this way a little bit. There you go. Not too much. Look at those hands. Follow those hands. Good. Turn your head. That's it there. Here, here. There. Good, good. Perfect. Good. Go. Stand nice and straight for me. And just turn to me a little bit. A little bit more. There you go. 
So I want you to pretend to look at the bird cage, but look a little bit past it this way, okay? Beautiful, good. There we go. So everyone's got an idea of your BTS setup and very compliant model. That was good. I hope she was paid. <laughs> <laughs> that, that was the compliant version. Oh, uh, there, there was some short clip. uncompliant <laughs> versions as well, I'm, I'm sure. Yeah, <laughs> fantastic. Okay, so um, I think we've covered the sort of background side of it. I'm just going to check uh, for questions. Amazing model, Linda says, absolutely. So, <laughs> Thank you, Linda. <laughs> thanks, Linda. Yeah, looks like she did uh, very well on uh, the, the, uh, the set itself. Same yeah. face when I photograph my daughter, Dave says. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> yeah. Um, Colour people asking about the cable length limit again. So I believe for USB-C it's, it's three metres, or that's the, the kind of recommended maximum. Yeah. Now, if yeah, you go, go to. beyond that, it might work, because you can buy four metres, four and a half metre uh, mm -hmm. cables uh, uh, and so on. Um, but just be aware that you then might kind of fall off the cliff of, of reliability yeah. in that respect. Um, I had a, a funny uh, experience with my MacBook. So I've got a MacBook Pro 16 inch. It's got four USB ports, so two on either side. Uh, GFX 100 flatly refused to tether on the right hand side. So I yeah. thought all ports were equal on the uh, MacBook Pro, but apparently not. So left hand no, side, not. tether's fine, right hand side, no bueno. Uh, but the X-T2, which I happen to have, was fine on all ports. So I think if you have any tethering issues, check the cable length, make it shorter, yep. try a different USB port. If all else fails, um, uh, then it's probably a duff cable. It's very rarely an issue with, you know, Capture yeah. One or your, your computer. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, always. Or a powered USB hub. That's also yeah, um, another, option. another option. Oh, a question from RLC. Cuba, uh, what yeah. was the trigger on the XT4? Is what, sorry? What was the trigger on the XT4? What was the trigger? Yeah, the flash trigger, I guess. The Oh, sorry. Yeah. Um, that is for my Pixar Pro lighting. So um, um, in the UK, it's known as Pixar Pro, but uh, obviously across the rest of the world, it's known as Godox. Oh, yeah. yeah. Um, so my lighting setup in these were um, two Godox AD600 Pros or mm -hmm. Pixar Pro City 600 Pros, as mm -hmm. they're called here and then another 600 head for the background. Right. Um, and that is just the um, the ST4 Pro transmitter, or they call it something different on Godox, Godox Pro something. <laughs> something, something. Um, yep. It's just that one, but it's for Fujifilm cameras. So very nice LCD, LCD display on that. You can just change and you know, control all your banks and groups of lights from there very easily with a scroll wheel. Very nice. Very, very simple user interface. Great, okay. Um, I am now gonna switch over to your Capture One screen. Ooh. So you can see us and Capture One, which is good. Now it gets real. Yep, now it gets real. <laughs> yeah, now just to explain, we, we I made Wayne run his screen in a slightly larger resolution just so it's easier to follow if you're on smaller screens or on a yes. lower quality you know, stream or, or whatever. So uh, yeah. Wayne now has to sit back a little bit to be able to, <laughs> to take to it all in. And of course your workspace in Capture One, which is customizable, uh, yes. You know, is designed for a much bigger display. So you, so Wayne will have yeah. to open and close things a bit more than he normally would, I guess. Yeah, yeah. yeah before I dropped the resolution, it was fine, but um, now everything's yeah. got super now large. I've, I've just ruined your your uh, cus lovely customized interface for you. And I'm sitting about six <laughs> feet away from my desk now. Yeah, yeah, quite. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Welcome. Yeah. Wow. Is that it? Should we should we dive into yeah, it? Yeah, dive into it. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. Well, I'll explain it for people. So. Uh, this first image that you're seeing here, because I'll get rid of the um, our, uh, our images down the right hand side in a moment. I'll get rid of the thumbnails when we're editing. Um, this is the flat image that you're seeing. Now, it will vary depending on the type of monitor you're on as well and mm -hmm. the browser you're using. I mean, I've got a double screen set up here with a BenQ for my retouch and an right. iMac 27 inch 5K screen to the right. And the image, the color and the contrast does look different on both of them. So you know if it's not quite your liking it will vary on your monitors so just be aware of that on the color and things um so this is the flat image this is straight out of camera um there are no adjustments on this at all you can see my background layer here is just a single shot i've not done anything on this yet so this is um, as it came out of the camera as it came out of the camera yeah um 
there you go there's my exposure white balance everything nothing has been changed i didn't even shoot a gray card for this one a color card which i normally do so naughty of me for that one <laughs> um i like to shoot them not everybody does but we're gonna we're gonna color grade this one anyway today so um you know it may not be that important we're not looking for color consistency oh and a little um, word about film simulations as well which of course hugely yeah popular on the indeed film cameras yeah indeed so uh the film simulation modes obviously we've got here in the color tab in base characteristics mm -hmm. now you can see here straight away it's on auto now for my fashion beauty work i generally shoot because the fujifilm comes in a standard which is provia for people that don't know in your film simulation mode your mm -hmm. standard which is your 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 native setting in the camera is is, is provia um, sometimes that's a bit too saturated in the in the skin tones for me for my right. fashion and beauty so i like to shoot proneg s um, which is a bit more desaturated or proneg h which just adds a bit more contrast depending what i'm shooting right and where do people find those in capture one um in your in your cameras you can just hit your d-pad on your xd4s mm -hmm. um hit your d-pad and you go into that or in your q menu you can go into in your quick menu you can go into your film simulation modes and choose which one you want mm -hmm. i've not changed anything else in camera you know all the um uh, shadow and highlight are all on zero everything's zeroed on that right so you're seeing that it's on auto here so basically capture one pro um, and just to let people know when you tether to capture one pro it will carry your film simulation mode you have set in your camera mm -hmm. straight through to your images in Capture One Pro. So that, that's that's a really important point, isn't it? So whatever you're set on the camera, as soon as you take a shot, it's yep. going to show up with that film simulation in Capture One. Now, if if you open the the curve drop down for us, yep, um, then it says Auto. So Auto yep. simply means, hey Capture One, use the film simulation that yep. was set in camera but the nice thing yeah. is as you're doing if you want to you know pick a different film simulation yep. then it's it's you, it's totally possible as well perfect and yeah. that's the joy of the film simulation modes with with capture one and fujifilm on the you know when being able to use them in, in raw because normally obviously when you shoot in camera they only apply to your jpeg not your raw exactly and then you're kind um, of locked down and they're baked in <laughs> yeah they're baked in then once they're in yeah. they're in but you know you can shoot raw now and you can come through to capture one and you can apply apply any of your film simulation modes here and and just to be clear sven uh, inside the webinar was asking is that with raw files and yes exactly so these are yeah. you know raw files as you've as you've set and james was asking the same thing uh, so yep. yeah these are these are raw files um so of course you can if you've accidentally picked the wrong film simulation which i've done several times yeah. um, <laughs> then uh, uh, then it doesn't matter you've got that get out of jail free card because you can just change film simulation retrospectively yeah. in capture one so you get the benefit of the film simulation which you know of course we know rather good um, yeah mixed in with raw edits and the ability to change it post-processing as well yeah yeah that's right that's right so this one is is pretty much pretty much shot in prone I guess I can tell you that by the flat tones in the in the skin and things. Now, I have shot this quite flat in terms of lighting. I've not added lots of contrast purely mm -hmm. because I wanted to show you the film simulation modes as you scroll through. Mm -hmm. And if I was to adapt my lighting and add a bit more dynamic, add a, add a bit more contrast to my scene, some of these would would look a bit too awful. In all fairness, right. Um, so that's why I've shot it a bit flatter and it's light. I just wanted that soft shadow tone that I can play with in post because I kind of know where I'm going with the image for its for mm -hmm. its edit. So same as when you do film, you know, the flatter you shoot it, the more potential yep. you've got for a color grade later on. Latitude, yes. The more latitude <laughs> in there, definitely. Uh, so the way I'm gonna the way I'm gonna work this today um, for people is I'm, I'm gonna I'm gonna add lots of layers. Yep. I'm gonna go through different sections. Cool. Um, and we will be working mainly between the color tab and the exposure tab at the top for this. I've already done a crop on it just to save the time on yeah. that. Sure, we all know um, how to crop. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> Saves time. A um, so, couple of so before we look at that, I just want to clear yeah. up a couple of other film simulation questions um, and one other thing on tethered. So Nick has I've just put his question on screen. Um, kind of summarizes what people are asking, which is how does it behave if you shoot to card so it's the same way so if i shoot to card with acros or whatever um then when i bring it into capture one capture one knows that i've shot with acros 
and it will yep. show in Capture One's interface with the Acros film simulation. Printing. But the yep. curve will say auto, so it's auto yes. means whatever you shot in camera. Um, and, if, and if you don't know, once you bring it in, if you can't remember what you've shot because it doesn't tell you anywhere in the raw, if you just come down over your film sim, yep. you know, and you hover beside it like this, I'm on standard. No, it's nothing's changing. Nothing's my changing. Image. Ah, good tip because that's so a, that is telling me that I shot that in Pro Next standard. Got it. Because right. that's that's if a I good a, tip because it is there is a slight sort of deficiency there that it doesn't remind yeah. you if you like what what film simulation. Yeah, um, just goes on auto. You're yeah. in exactly. Uh, so Nick, I hope that answers your question. And also in terms of the development of these f film simulations, uh, this was very much a partnership between us, Capture One, and Fujifilm. Yeah. So we like yeah. to think they're pretty close, if not almost identical, with the obvious um, you know, limitations in mind, that they're very close to what you see in yes. camera on the display compared to what very. you see in Capture yeah. One. So I don't know if that's very. your experience, Wayne. <laughs> yeah, it is very close. Yeah. yeah, 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 very, very close. Very, very nice to have them. Mm. Nice to have that, um, you know, that go-to to be able to just apply them mm. to your RAWs and then and use them as a base model, which is what I'm going to do here. Yeah, and the final film simulation, or maybe not the final film simulation, <laughs> uh, Jim uh, was asking, uh, was does it work on any one Capture, Capture One version or you need to have the Fujifilm version? So for people who don't know, we have Capture One Pro, uh, which supports all camera models, Fujifilm, Sony, Nikon, Canon, Olympus, Pentax, etc. Um, that has Fujifilm simulations. And then we also have Capture One Pro Fujifilm, which only supports Fujifilm cameras. That also has film simulations. We also have Capture One Express, which is free. So basic editing, raw conversion, that also has Fujifilm simulations. So you don't need the special Fujifilm version, and it works on Pro and Express as well. So, yes. Yeah. Um, I think that cleared up our film simulation questions. Um, let's see. Uh, and the last thing, I just wanted you to show the camera tool tab in Capture One. Yes. Just so, obviously, again, today we couldn't do our lovely uh, in-house next to each other shoot <laughs> yeah, as sadly. we had dreamed. <laughs> um, but when your camera is connected, then essentially it shows up in that camera tool. Yeah. yeah. And, and the good thing is when you connect the Fuji cameras now to Capture One Pro, it, it's automatically there straight away in, in like a blister at a blistering speed. It, the connection now is just so, so seamless. Yeah. I know with some manufacturers, you still have to go down and choose camera. I know I used to have to do that on my old Canons. Mm -hmm. Obviously, I know it was a few years ago, but um, now it just shows automatically and all your settings show and you can obviously change some of your parameters and settings um, from the desktop here if you're, you know, shooting remotely from your keyboard. Yeah. And what's your experience in time to taking a picture to it visible in Capture One? Uh, the time to time for the image to come through? Yeah, yeah. Oh, gosh. Uh, a second? Yeah, almost instant. Yeah, Yeah, almost instant. Yeah, I've never counted that, actually. That's yeah. a good question. Yeah, it's, it's, <laughs> it's pretty quick. We're quite proud of our, I uh, uh, can't remember what we call it, but the, the time time to view in Capture One from hitting the, yeah. the shutter. Uh, is is pretty quick, especially with the XT4 because it's on USB-C, so it's yes. good data transfer rate as well. So when you take yeah. a shot, you're not like hanging around for ages, waiting yeah. for it to to come through. Yeah. Yeah, that's yeah. it. Cool. All that's right. That's it. So yeah, that, I just wanted to clear a couple of those bits and pieces up. Again, something we could have shown if we were in the same studio, <laughs> but a little <laughs> bit tricky. Nice to when show that. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Okay, so so we're at the point now where uh, you've shot. We're in Capture One, film yes. simulation applied, but everything else is zeroed out. Correct. Yeah. Correct. Yep. Now, obviously, I've done my session. Normally, if I was shooting commercially, I'd name my folders in a completely different way, but mm -hmm. obviously not relevant for this demonstration today. So we can go straight into the edit on this. That's fine. Okay, so let, let's get into it. I'm going to put about, just to let people know, about, about 12 or 13 layers of edit on this today. Um, some of them are just fine-tuning previous layers because mm -hmm. I've changed my mind as I go through, but it just goes to show you what we can do. And hopefully uh, we're going to get somewhere near our final image that we've already shown. That's, yeah, it's um, a lot of layers. <laughs> it would be nice. Yeah. It's a lot of layers, isn't it? And they're not all massive, but um, you know, some of them are just fine adjustments. Uh, and that's the key in this is just do fine adjustments. Um, so let's add a first one. I wouldn't normally do this, but I'm going to do it for the purpose of just this webinar. So I'm going to add a new field layer, and I'm basically just going to call that background. 
Um, sorry, that's my second layer. I'm going to mm -hmm. call that uh, global adjustments. Now, normally I would do that on the background layer, mm -hmm. um, but I'm just going to put it on here just for ease of use. Um, so I'm going to mess everyone up to begin with. Um, and this is a Fuji X, a Fuji Film XT4 uh, thing. So I'm going to go for my, as I said at the beginning, I normally shoot Pro Neg S or Pro Neg right. H. Um, and I'm going to go to the new lovely classic Neg mm -hmm. film simulation mode, which is not in the XT3 yet. Um, but already you can see it's given me a lovely warm tone mm, very much. Uh, in there. And it's also, you know, just added a bit more contrast in there for me as well. Mm -hmm. So I've gone to classic Neg for this one. Okay, so I'm going to come back to my exposure tab. I am going to bizarrely go in and cool this down a little bit now. So I'm going to come down, just cool it down a little bit. Sort of about there, that'll do. So I've now I've gone a little bit uh, a bit bluer with the scene. I'm not going to change too much on the exposure. Just a little bit. Just minor adjustment. I might just bring my brightness up a touch. You see how small those increments are? You know, if I just, you know, hit the Alt key and hit my reset, just that 0 0.03 exposure mm -hmm. and three on brightness, you can see that changing on and off. It's very, very subtle. Yes. Now I'm going to go and play with my dynamic range a little bit. Obviously, I can't have all my tool tabs open on this, but <laughs> here we go. So I'm going to pull my highlights up a little bit. I don't know about about there so just just pulling them up a little bit my highlights mm, just to brighten um, them a touch yeah. just to brighten a little bit mm -hmm. yeah my shadows i'm going to go the other way because i know where i'm going later it does look a bit flatter when when you do this but don't worry we're gonna sort that out later okay and then i'm just going to pull my whites up a little bit i think just to make them pop a little oh sorry my pen and tablet is very sensitive should change the sensitivity on this really <laughs> probably because um, i've ruined your resolution on screen yeah that's right <laughs> it's so different <laughs> it's so different um so i'm gonna take my blacks down a touch and you notice because i've got the light feathering off that i'm getting mm. that natural vignette i'm not actually adding a vignette so right. i don't i'm not using a vignette tool at all today mm -hmm. all right um so i think that's that's fine for that my high dynamic range it's looking a bit muddy at the moment isn't it on this one but that's fine um on my levels i do like to pull the blacks in a little bit from zero again yeah, my pen is so sensitive it's so <laughs> weird <laughs> um that's fine i'm just going to pull now i'm going to use my top top tab on this now if i put my exposure warning tool in it shows you that my shadows my shadow warning is there but mm -hmm. that that'll come back later so don't worry um i am in just my rgb i am just going to pull the my highlight down to about 245 it just mutes the palette a little bit for yeah me. that that will give you like a, a more i think yeah mutes the right word like a sort of lower contrast in the upper end of the tonal range yeah mm. yeah indeed and now i'm going to go into my curve i just want to affect my mid-tones at the moment i just want to balance these mid-tone areas out a little bit here um so for that i don't want to affect the saturation of my color when I'm boosting my mid-tones. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to go to my mid-tones here, um, and I'm going to go, I don't know, probably about, God, it's very, I'm trying to do it as fine as I can with this, about <laughs> here. So if I just on and on and off that, you can see, oop, he's just moving his tab. Yep. So it's lifted my mid-tones quite a bit. Now I'm going to flip over to my RGB scale. A quick, quick case in point for those yep. who, were, who, who were not so intimate with Capture One. So you, you manipulated a, a Luma curve, and now you're going yes. to RGB. So the difference yes. between the two is, and you can yes. answer that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so if, if you adjust your, your, your curve in RGB, it will also affect the saturation mm -hmm. of your scene, your colors. So just be aware of that. So if I reduce my mid-tones, it's also going to start pulling the color out of my mid-tones. So mm -hmm. whereas I'm boosting my mid-tones, if I now boost my mid-tones in RGB, it's it's going to start applying a saturated color if mm -hmm. you have any strong colors within that mid-tone range. Um, so just be aware of that. Increasing uh, any levels in RGB will, uh, your curve in RGB will also increase the saturation. Exactly. So your Luma curve is good if you want to affect the, the, the tone curve but not affecting your colors yeah, it's or good separation it's a pure contrast adjustment leaves the color well alone yeah. so it's very very That's powerful right. mm -hmm. so i'm going to go here about not too much 
Where am I? God, it's so sensitive. <laughs> <laughs> oh, who, who just had a helicopter? Was that you or me? Uh, I think that's me yeah. with a helicopter. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm going to come about about here. I'm going to pull them down a little bit. God, that is so tricky. Mm -hmm. um, so there you go. I'll just do little changes for you so you can see. Mm -hmm. Okay. So just pulling that down. So I think for that, that's that's all the adjustments I want to make in, in that one. So this is oh. what you would call your overall adjustments for the whole shot? Mm. Yeah, that's my what I call I always call global adjustments. Mm -hmm. so that's where I adjust my contrast, my exposure, um, my shadows, my highlights, my, my general. Now, if I'm shooting tethered commercially in a studio, I will generally put a bit of a tone curve and things in there to, mm -hmm. to suit my shoot, you know, before you get started in the shoot. Mm -hmm. And sometimes we may even play with the color a little bit if we're not having to be color accurate for an you know, if it's for an editorial or something. So, um, and I generally like to shoot that baked in so that the client can uh, get a rough idea of where the color is going and the look of the shoot is going. Mm -hmm. um, it's nice for them to see that rather than shooting fly into camera and then just, you know, making adjustments yeah. in post. And, so. and that's a good point for those if you want to try shooting tethered with yeah. your Fujifilm cameras. Um, when you shoot and you make an edit, the next shot that comes in by default will carry over those settings. So as Wayne said, yes. like if you want to bake in a look, um, yep. then you can set that up on your test shot. And then as you shoot, you know, every shot comes in um, with those new adjustments. So it always carries over to the next one. Yep, yeah, with that applied. So what I've changed now, if I now plug my camera in and take a shot, it's pretty much going to come through. Come through exactly that. as that. So your yeah. client, if you have a client with you or yourself, is just as important. Um, <laughs> then you can see how the, the shot is developing as, as well. Yes, mm -hmm. indeed. Right. So now I'm going to add another field layer. Okay, and I'm going to call that my background layer. Okay, now for this one, excuse me, got an itch. Um, for this <laughs> one, I'm going into my color tab. Now, what I'm going to do here is I'm going to go into my color editor. Mm -hmm. Oh gosh, can't get my screens up here at all, can we? <laughs> <laughs> they all jump around. <laughs> so what I'm going to do, I just want to change the the color tone of my background a little bit i want to take it a little bit more um down to the sort of the the, the blue and the teal the, the aqua blue sort of teal sort of area so what i'm going to do is i'm going to come in here and what you can do is you can pick an area oh there it goes mm -hmm. and you can see the selected color range that it's got from here okay so there we are um that's not too bad actually from there so what I'm going to do is I'm just going to shorten its color range. Just going to bring that in a little bit. And basically, what I'm doing with this triangle is I'm, I'm limiting the color range that it's got that it's affecting in the scene. So I'm sort of shortening that that in. And you can see here it's got a nice feathered edge around there as well. So it's not going to be a hard stopped color shift no, around that no triangle. No nasty posterizations. Yeah. No nasty posterization. Okay. That's it. Perfect from there. So if I take that now. Now, what I do generally with my with my layers, I don't generally work them at 100% when I start getting into color and things. Right. So the good thing with layers, we can change their opacity. So straight off the bat, I'm going to drop this down to about 70-ish. Um, and then I can always increase the intensity of that effect or the color change that I'm doing or, or, or reduce it a bit more. Gives you so that the easy retrospective change, I guess. Yes, yeah. that's right. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to come down to the blue end of the scale. You see it start changing in a mm -hmm. minute with saturation as well. But I'm going to pull my hue down. Probably to about here. Um, and then my saturation, I'm going to increase my saturation now in this. Oh, not too much. Probably around here. You can see it shifting ever so slightly. Mm -hmm. And then I want to keep that a little bit darker in, in terms of its tone. So I'm going to take the lightness of this shift probably down about here okay so there you go so that is my before and after so you can see I've now changed the color tone of my background a little bit giving it a bit of a hue mm -hmm. and nice okay. nice isolation hasn't changed anything in your subject as well 
yes, luckily yeah. my subject is not wearing not... anything of the same colour. <laughs> Always so... helpful. <laughs> <laughs> so that, that's that's a relief in that respect. Yeah. Um, little question uh, from from Lee, and uh, I think uh, uh, Lee Forland in the webinar, and I think a few other people will probably muse the same thing as well about layers in Capture One and how they compare to to Photoshop. I guess it's a it's a similar principle. Except it is, it is a similar principle. I think the main difference is you, you like in Photoshop. Normally, you would have them in a particular order, layer upon layer, and yes. you know you would put them in the in the stack order. Yeah. In Capture One Pro, you don't have to worry about that. Doesn't really, matter. So that's pretty no. cool. And Doesn't we're working matter. on the raw data, so you've got all that flexibility of the raw file as as well. Um, yeah. But it's essentially a similar principle. You you draw a mask or you create a mask with a gradient filter. Um, yep. or, a, or a radial filter or a luminosity mask or a whole bunch of other ways that we don't have time to get into today. Um, but yep. it's essentially create a mask and then edits on that mask only happen on that layer. But the benefit yes. of what you're doing with the field layer, which is like a mask over the, you know, the, the whole shot, is that you can yep. separate your edits out into different layers, change the opacity as you've done, Wayne, to yes. 70%. So Wayne can retrospectively give it less or give it more yeah, in the post-production fiddling stage or whatever. Yeah. <laughs> um, but that's that's generally it. similar, similar but different, if you like. There's some more powerful things in Capture One with layers, um, and there's some more powerful things in Photoshop with layers. So it's, it's just yeah, different because we're working on the, the raw data as well. So sorry, it, little. It, it is, no, that's fine. It is different, but it's nice to have a raw editor that has so much power in it mm. to do that you, only used to be able to do in something like Photoshop. Exactly, because really the and domain of the raw converter was to make it raw into something which would then go into Photoshop. But now we yeah. can do a lot more than we could do in the past. Yeah, yeah, yeah it's awesome, and the speed of it as well is 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 awesomely quick, which is really really nice. Mm -hmm. So that that's the good thing. And the good thing is, you know, if you're shooting something that's a static subject, um, and you've got seven or eight shots like that, then you can pretty much copy the you know, copy those um, those presets over to the next image. You can do a copy and paste of all yep. those presets, which is cool. Mm -hmm. Obviously, if you've got somebody that's moving and you're doing any masking on skin, then obviously that's not going to work. You no. have to change, change your mask <laughs> later on. Quite. Anyway, <laughs> sorry for that into. interruption. So <laughs> That's fine. <laughs> it's fine. So um, that's all I want to do with the background. Um, so now I'm going to start just changing my skin a little bit. Because if you look at the areas, I mean, you know, my daughter's only five years old. She's, mm. you know, she's not out getting suntans and things. So we have right. a color difference and saturation and tone difference in our skin layers. So let's try and balance those out a little bit. Um, so for this one, I'm going to go to a new field layer. So you'll just work on the the chest area first. So going to call that one chest. Okay. So I'm going to go in here and I'm going to use the Luma Range tool. Um, which is, oh, oh, let me show the mask first. Mm -hmm. uh, I forgot to do that. So to show your mask, just hit your M key. That shows me that it's a filled layer with a full mm -hmm. mask. Okay, and now I'm going to go into my Luma range. Now, I only want to affect this area here. So I don't want to be affecting any shadows and not really too much of the midtones. So I'm going to pull my shadows up here. I'm going to pull them all the way up richly right to the end almost mm -hmm. there and what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna feather that selection off a little bit so it's not so hard on the edge okay somewhere around around there okay I'm gonna pull my highlights in a little bit so I don't want to affect any everything so out so I'm gonna put them about 255 to feather off a little bit um, I'm gonna just change my radius a smidge nothing major Okay, so that's my that's my mask. So right. that's showing me this area. Now what I can do is obviously picked up some other areas within that Luma mask ma Luma mask range, <laughs> which I don't want. Put yep. my teeth in for that one. <laughs> um, so what I'm going to do is I'm just going to go to my eraser tool, which is E on your keyboard. Um, use the square bracket keys to change its size. Uh, if you hit Control on your keyboard, you can mm -hmm. change its hardness, opacity, and everything else. So let me just change the flow to 100%. And all I'm going to do is get rid of the areas I don't want to be affected, nice. which I don't want the bird cage to be affected. I'm just going to brush those out. I don't really want the face to be affected. Let's just punch in on this a little bit. Don't really want my face to be affected. Mm -hmm. Now, my center circle is my main zone. And obviously, that's my feather on the outside. And so just reduce that a touch. I'm just going to come in here and get rid of it in the hair. 
So essentially this is just a good speedy way to draw a mask which would be a bit tricky to do by hand. So the, yes. the, the Luma mask really just puts a constraint on the field mask that Wayne made earlier. And then yep. you can decide, do I want highlights? Do I want midtones? Do I want shadows? Um, That's right. And then after that case, once the Luma range has put that constraint on your field mask, if there's any areas that you don't want, then you can just quickly zap them with the eraser yep. as Wayne is doing as well. There we go. Yeah. Right. So I'm just going to do that there. So now I'm going to go to my skin tone tab. Let's just turn the mask off there a section. A second. So that's my metal layer. Um, I'm going to keep that one at 100% on this one. What I'm going to do is going to go to my skin tone and I'm going to pick an area that I would like it to balance out to. So let's just pick an area about there. It's pretty good actually. Pretty good. Okay. So from there, so what I'm going to do now is I'm going to go down to my uniformity tool, which is going to even those tones out and try and match it to the point source that I selected. So I'm really going to ramp this up because it is a very fine adjustment, especially mm -hmm. on this type of skin tone. Yep. Uh, about there, I'm going to put my saturation up. That changes the amount. You probably won't be able to see this unless I zoom in a bit, actually. Yeah, this, the skin tone tab of the color editor is like a, a finely nuanced, if you like, <laughs> a yeah, tool just very for fine. adjusting uh, skin. So what the uniformity does is if yep. you like in that the, the triangle that you see that Wayne selected, anything in that space will be, or anything in that triangle will be, if you like, compressed or converted or normalized yep. or equalized to the picked point. So if, yes. I, if I've got like a super red cheek or something, if I pick my the skin tone below my cheek, then essentially you can, you balance, can balance that out. So if you've yep. got models with cold hands or whatever, or uneven suntans or hot cold yeah. etc um <laughs> then you can, can yeah balance it out balance it out easily yes. yeah and we're going to do that because we're going to do the hands and the face separately so we people can see that because obviously the hands and the forearms are a lot richer in 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 warm tone yeah than, than the chest area so we're going to try and balance those out a little bit mm -hmm. so this is very fine if i click my before and after just look at the chest area only not the rest of the picture because that's obviously the only piece we've affected mm -hmm. You can see I've just oh, brought yeah. that color down yeah. a little bit. Very, very fine. Mm -hmm. So nice. once I've got that layer there in the color tab, I'm going to go over to the the exposure tab. I'm going to make a couple more adjustments in here, and it will only be to that area. Mm -hmm. Let's get rid of our white balance. Let's get our exposure up. Now I'm going to pull my brightness down a little bit in that area. See it change ever so slightly. Mm -hmm. Um, and I'm going to increase my saturation a little bit. Oh, he says. To about <laughs> there. Too much. <laughs> <laughs> is, that, is, that, is that good there? Yeah. Perfect. <laughs> Perfect. Perfect. Okay. Yeah. It's so sensitive, isn't it, when you change that screen resolution? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so what I want to do now is I just want to go into my highlight tool, and I'm just going to bring the highlight of that area down a little bit as well. Uh probably around here I think would be good enough mm -hmm. yeah it's balanced okay. that out very nice it's balanced that out mm. so if I turn if I turn that whole layer on and off yeah before you can see it it's in its entirety mm -hmm. now it's really just brought that color tone yeah. down seamless skin tone down mm -hmm. all right okay so that's all we're going to do for that one nice um which will be oh, nice and easy um so let's go on as we're still on skin let's go and tackle the hands okay on here now let's just bring the image back out Let's add another field layer on here. Yeah, you, I definitely know when we're working with someone who's used Photoshop in the past because everything they do on layers, <laughs> everything <Yeah>. is divided <laughs> up. Yeah, <laughs> which is no so, bad thing because it gives you that that flexibility afterwards as well. Yeah, yeah. that's right. Yeah, and and the good thing is when you look at your layers, it tells you that you've got a loom adjustment. It also tells you here you've got an exposure adjustment, mm -hmm. so it tells you you've got a different tab adjustment in here. Mm -hmm. So that's pretty cool. Um, so for for the hands now, let's let's do this a different way. Um, let's go in. Um, actually, I did that as a field layer, didn't I? Yes, I did. I wanted wanted to do it as a um, invert mask. Yeah. All clear either and all clear mm -hmm. right so i'm going to brush in my layer this time so i'm going to hit my brush tool uh same as always i'm going to increase my brush size 
Uh, again, we can change its flow and opacity here. I'm going to keep the flow pretty much at 100%. My pen pressure is turned on, as you can see, uh, if you use a pen and a brush. And I like to link my brush and eraser settings up, which means that my brush tool and eraser tool are the same size when I switch between them. So let's just bring this up a little. I'm just going to do the arms on this. Um, this will be quite quick. Um, due to its time constraints. So basically, <laughs> see, we've got t 10 minutes in theory, but I'm sure we can go a bit, <laughs> a bit longer. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So there you go. I'm just going to brush very quickly around here. Obviously, we would do this a bit more accurate uh, normally. Um, oops. I'm not going to do that. I hit my uh, button on my pen. Yeah, while you're All doing right. that, Wayne, um, you relax and draw. Um, I was going to answer a question from uh, it was, was it Eddie? Yeah, Eddie, who was in the webinar room, was asking, what does Radius do in the Luma range? So while you're brushing, I will briefly yep. try to explain that. Hold on one so. second, David, <laughs> just, to let people, just to let people know quickly on this before you get into that. Yep. So if you um, go and right click on your layer, you can then go into Aha, Fill Mask. Fill Mask to fill the whole And it in. will. Yeah, there we go. Oh, it wasn't joined up. There you go. But it will fill the rest of the mask in for you. Yeah. OK. If, if he was joined up, yeah. Um, so Eddie was asking, what does Radius do? So so as you saw Wayne adjusting Luma range, you decide on highlights, midtone, shadows, or broad range, narrow range. That's, that's, you know, fairly straightforward. What Radius and sensitivity does is control how the edges wrap around, um, like the edge of the mask, okay. Uh, you can watch some of our previous webinars and quick lives, which goes into it in a bit more detail. But essentially, with radius at zero, the mask can be sort of relatively crude. It has a, somewhat of a harder fall off. Um, as you increase the radius, that first of all decides how much of the edge Capture One wants to examine. Is it just a very finite edge or how far out from the edge do we want to go? And then below that, the sensitivity slider all the way to the left, it will uh, feather the mask, so it will make it very soft, which is sometimes good for applications like this. All the way to the right, it will like wrap around the edge of something. So if you've loom a mask around a tree or something like that, it will literally hug every leaf and branch and twig that you can see. Um, whereas uh, all the way to zero, it will be very soft. Anywhere in between is like a kind of combination of the two. So find a photo with a broad range of tones, put a field mask on it, apply a loom range and just have a play around, then you can really see what it does. So I assume you've drawn your mask by now, Wayne. I wasn't. I have drawn my mask. There, there it is for people to see. Yeah. Um, it is a very quick mask. That's, I wouldn't normally do it. A and lot. The thing is, it's a skin tone, so it's not necessarily yeah. spilling over into the background or her dress or anything. That's like correct. That. I've not got any similar colors in there. So yeah. I'm already going through my uniformity tool to try and balance that out now a little bit. OK, and then I'm just going to put a bit of lightness in there about mm -hmm. there roughly um so i can see the before and after when we just come out of that remember i am very, making very subtle differences you see how that redness has gone from the forearms mm -hmm. okay just coming in there so now that i'm on that i'm going to come back over to the exposure tool tab okay i'm just going to take this down a little bit the color balance there we go just taking that down about 3600 degrees Kelvin just to change that and let's take my contrast down a little bit because I don't want the shadows to be too hard there let's take saturation down a touch he says if he can control his <laughs> pen and tablet um, so my high dynamic range I'm just gonna pull those highlights down a little bit on there Looking between my two screens, and I'm going to pull my shadows a little touch on there. Nice. About there, and that's it. That's all I'm going to do in the exposure tab. So now, if I turn that layer on and off, you can see I've softened my shadows a little bit. Nice. Yep. Just balances it's probably, it out with the chest better. Yep. Yeah. The color's probably gone a little bit off on the selection there because I couldn't get those fine numbers with my pen and at this speed. <laughs> Normally I wouldn't work this quick. <laughs> <laughs> Under pressure, Wayne. Um, <laughs> pressure, isn't it? Yeah. Pressure, pressure. Right, brilliant. Right. So now we're going to go an overall, a new layer. We're going to go a, uh, actually let's go an empty layer on this. 
you could do you could do this with the luma mask mm. um but i'm going to do a little cheat here so i'm going to call this skin okay i'm going to drop this down to about 70 percent here because i don't want the full strength of it now the good thing is i can cheat i want to do a a mask now on all the skin area again as a whole so the face the neck the arms and the hands so instead of painting it all in again mm. if i hit my control on my mask i can copy my mask from my hands ah. so it basically means that i have them already in place and i don't have to paint them again right. but now i can just grab my brush tool and, and add to that and selection add a bit to that nice good tip add a bit to that so it was so right click a... on the layer copy mask from. yes correct yeah yep. and let's do this quickly so remember i'm on seven oh, that's a bit rough that one isn't it we'll tidy that up in a second like you david i've heard you say before sometimes it's easier to paint your mask yeah, and erase and then, back and your then mistakes erase back the bits you yeah. yeah you don't want yeah now remember i don't want my eyes or lips involved in this i just want my skin tone i'll just put my brush size a little bit okay so just gonna make a very quick selection here and you can refine this the, mask the, as well the copy mask um technique is quite handy if you want the inverse of something like if you've masked something in the foreground and you want the background you can just copy that and invert it to save you the the job yes yeah yeah a big time saver big time saver okay yeah uh well, i wouldn't say just big time i think it's just a, a brilliant way for the tool to work yeah okay so a very quickly done that in there like that okay a little bit on the flowers there take it off there you go Oop. Um, brilliant so let's get rid of that mask now I'm gonna go back to my color tab on this and I'm gonna come down to my skin tone tool again now I'm gonna pick probably around here as my skin section now I just want to narrow its range a little bit don't want it to be quite as and the good thing is you can pull the selection up and move it a touch as well mm -hmm. You're not completely happy with it so i'm just narrowing it. i'm going to leave the the, the, the feather on there the, the smooth edge on there because it's a nice subtle difference so again go down to our uniformity tool now remember i'm affecting all of it as a whole now now that i've done their individual adjustments um i'm going to pull the saturation with this probably up to 100 all the way up and and my lightness just probably around here looks good for me you know it's, it's all evening out a little bit now Okay, and now I'm going to jump back to my main settings here in the amount where I'm affecting the whole scene rather than the uniformity section. So let's take my saturation down to about here. Looks good. Um, and I'm going to bring my lightness up a little bit just to lighten the whole section of that. Very nice. Probably about there. Balancing out, balancing all those red bits. <laughs> okay. Um, so that's pretty cool. Um, remember, just be selective where your source you're taking your source point from. Okay, that's that's the main thing here in these kind of things. Um, now my eyes are a little bit dark here, so I just want to add another empty layer. Now you could for the black for the for the pupils you could, you know, use a luma mask mm -hmm. um, and just pick up on your your shadow tones if you wanted. Um, I'm going to go in the quick and dirty route. Um, I'm going to come in with a brush. Now, the important thing here, let's just change my opacity down a bit, take it down a little bit. Now, I just want to brighten up these circles a little bit in the pupils. So what I'm going to do, and this is the important bit of using mm. your your brush flow and everything else here. Um, I want to affect these a lot. So I'm going to apply 100% brush on that. Right. I'm going to apply, he says, <laughs> pen stop working. <laughs> oh, hold on a second. I've got a bit of a, a lockup. Oh, a pen lockup. Oh, there it is. It's oh, back. there we go. Okay. It's back. Oh, demon child now. Okay. <laughs> 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 so I'm just going to take out, because I want to affect the tops of the eyes. So I just flick in E and B on my keyboard mm -hmm. to go between my mm -hmm. eraser and my brush. Okay, so that's at 100% opacity. Um, but I also want to, if I come back a little bit, I just want to pull a little bit of light up across here as well. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to keep it pulled out like that and increase my brush a little bit. 
and then I'm going to come back in here and just put my my flow all the way down so it's only a gentle amount and you can do that over the top you see now and this oh, okay. is only very yeah, gentle yeah. nice idea yep so I'm just going to come through and remember if I keep brushing over the same spot then it's increasing that flow at that opacity mm -hmm. so here I've only done one pass in the darker area here I've done a couple of passes got it so very very subtle from there um, and basically what I'm going to do is I'm going to go into my exposure tab let's take that mask off um, and I just want to pull I'm not going to change the exposure I'm just going to change the brightness a little bit just to lift it a touch because I only want to lift the darker areas not um, the whole exposure of everything so you see the difference there if I click out on and off mm -hmm. Okay, and again, Just if you're not happy with that, you can change your opacity of that layer a little bit. Okay, so very, very fine differences. And if you're not happy with the mask and it's doing a bit too much, you can erase a bit down there if you wanted to. If this edge was a bit too harsh, you can just erase that off. But that is actually the natural area of the skin tone, so we'll leave that light. It's the way the light is falling on the cheek. Nice. Okay. So that's the eyes on and off for you. Okay, so that's all I'm going to change on that one. Just a little delicate piece. Um, and for me, I just want to take the saturation down of the hair and the cheeks a little bit. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to add a new layer. I'm going to call that hair and face. Okay. And again, I'm going to brush this mask in. It says, I'm trying to zoom in. <laughs> Let's just get rid of the images there. That's better. There we go. So I'm gonna, just going to come around here. I'm just going to do a very quick brush. I'll make this really quick. I'll speed this up a little bit. Come here. I'm just going to whiz around here a touch. I notice I've got my opacity turn, my uh, flow turned down overnight. Yeah, that's cool. Good. I'm just going to come around here and now affect the whole scene together. Obviously, I don't want the eyes involved. So let's just get rid of those quick... Well, it is a quick mask, isn't it? Jeez. <laughs> <laughs> right. Let's take those back out. Don't want the eyes to be affected or the lips. Don't want to take the saturation out of the lips. Nope. Um, we'll leave the rest as it is. Quick and dirty. <laughs> <laughs> um, just brush that in a bit there. Okay cool right so from there all I'm gonna do is go into my saturation and I'm just gonna take it down a little bit okay very very subtle just to mm. take the redness out mm -hmm. of those cheeks a little bit so you see the especially on the right hand side cheek here mm -hmm. I punch in if I do the before and after now you can see it's just taking that redness out of that skin just to touch as a whole and the warmth out of the hair a little bit mm-hmm very nice okay um, so from there I want to sort the shadows out in the dress now so let's go to a field layer I'm going to put that in there um, I'm going to leave this at 100% I'm going to put my mask on but I'm going to use my luma range now I just want to affect the shadow areas so I'm going to pull my highlight what I'm going to do is pull my shadows down all the way so there's no feather on right. that edge and then I'm going to pull my highlights down so I'm not affecting any of the highlight in the scene. We're about here, roughly. Okay, and then I can... Maybe a bit more there, and then I can just feather this off a little bit. Let's just pull that radius up a touch. We're jumping around all over the place, isn't it? Um, <laughs> So basically, that's all of that. Now, I only want to affect the dress and not the background. Okay, that's the biggest thing uh, that we got here. Let's right. just take this one. No. Okay. Okay. Oops. God, it's jumpy. Jumpy, jumpy. Right. We'll leave it at that. <laughs> okay, there you go. You see it's shifted now. All right. Um, so brilliant. Now that I'm applying that selection... There we go. I'm going to take my eraser tool. 
and just only want kill it to... some of the background stuff. Yeah. Yeah, you got it. You got it. Let's kill some of the background <laughs> stuff. So let's put that up there. Let's get rid of all of this. We don't want it to affect any of that. He says, trying to look around his light that he's got in his own face. <laughs> <laughs> he's got a bit of glare on screen. Okay, I'll make this very quick. Okay. Let's just refine this down a little bit. Okay, cool. Right. So a quick man. So all I want to do is just to pull pull the shadow tones up on this dress mm. because they are quite dark in the bottom. Um, so I'm just going to get rid of this. It's like speed editing, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> the good thing uh, is you can... Now this is when you realise just how long you spend editing a picture <laughs> yeah, when the, the right. clock's the clock's not on you. <laughs> yeah, that's it. Maybe that's it. this will help your productivity. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, maybe or yeah. sanity. <laughs> so let's just brush it back in on that shadow area there. Okay, cool. Right. So there we go. So I'm just going to affect that now um, in my exposure tab, and all I'm going to do mm -hmm. is I'm going to take the mask off. I'm going to pull the saturation down a little bit. Okay. So uh, up a little bit. Sorry. Just to put a bit of color back in there. Mm -hmm. If it won't stop jumping around, thereabouts, that looks okay. Um, and then I'm going to lift my shadows just ever so slightly. I think that's cool. And then lift my blacks. Literally, if you, if you just a slight touch, if you want to type numbers in here, you can just tap it and type the numbers in if you want to do it that way. That's okay. fine. And so, you can use your cursor keys for like fine control as well. Should you yeah. wish, yeah. Yeah, that's right. So I'm literally going to pull my mid-tones over. I think that's probably quite nice. And then I'm just going to brighten it up a little bit. Probably about there. So I'm really affecting that in my levels as well. OK. Um, so that's all I'm going to do for that one. But you see the difference. There's my before and there's my after. Just brought some life back into the dress. Nice. Obviously, my mask is a bit rubbish around here. <laughs> uh, you would fine tune it a little bit. Yeah, you would just hit the erase tool and just feather that off a little bit more. <laughs> As I say, well, we're yeah. not we're not judging, Wayne. We're not judging. We're not judging. <laughs> <laughs> no, please don't judge. <laughs> uh, right. So now I just want to add a bit more pop into this. So I'm going to put what I call a, we'll just call it curve pop. There you go. So like your um, and finish, finished off kind of uh, overall adjustment, I guess. Yeah, I yeah. just just want to add a little bit something in it. Oh, he says, as his name keeps changing. So that's a field layer, um, just so people can see. Mm -hmm. um, and again, I'm going to go in and use my lovely Luma. Um, tool in my curves because I don't want to affect the saturation. So I'm going to put a shadow point here. Okay, and I'm going to just pull that down a little bit about there, and then I'm going to just put my highlights up a bit, probably around there. So nothing major. But if I do a before and after on that, oh, he says. So there we go. I'm going to pull it down. It looks like counterintuitive at the moment, but you'll see why. Okay. Mm. Um, and that's all I'm going to do on that one. Okay. Um, and then we're going to go and give it a color grade. Ah. So let's do the fun stuff now. So call this color grade. Oh, he says <laughs> type. <laughs> Everyone across the channel is going, you spelled color wrong. <laughs> <laughs> yep. <laughs> That's the thing, isn't it? <laughs> it's uh, um, old English. That's right. Actually, we had a had a comment earlier um, from a tinfoil veteran who actually yes. thought we were American. So, oh, really? Um, yeah, we're. Uh, uh, it is developed by a Danish company, um, but everyone sounds very American. We are about as 
British as it gets, I would think, <laughs> Wayne, with our vanilla. Oh, no, you're from the north originally, aren't you? So I no, think... I'm, from the, I'm from the southwest. Southwest, okay. Southwest, so, yeah. yeah. So I have no accent whatsoever, and you have some accent. So, um, yeah. yeah. <laughs> definitely yeah. not American, yeah. <laughs> no, definitely not American, no. <laughs> right, so I'm going to jump in. I'm going to affect my... Um, my shadows, my midtones, my highlights. Now, of course, mm -hmm. with these color tabs, you can pull them, enlarge them if you want a better sort of adjustment. Mm -hmm. um, so let's go in and see what we can do. So I'm just going to pull my midtones. I want to warm them up a little bit. Somewhere around there. Um, again, we can change our saturation and our, our luminance here, or our lightness, if you want to call it that. Um, I want to make my shadows a little bit towards the blue. So let's do that. Let's take this blue completely we're going to take the opacity of this down in a minute mm -hmm. anyway so i wouldn't worry let's do that now let's take it down about 70 that's so we a, can it's see a good, it. good tactic to sort of overcook the color grade a bit and then moderate it with opacity i think that gives you a nice end result i think yeah mm. and the good thing is if you don't want to move the circle around you can move it around with this uh, mm -hmm. little tag here you can move that around and again you can adjust your height your lightness on this side and your saturation on the left side so that's quite good. But I think that tone is uh, a very quick, pretty good. And then you can just pop that back into your stack wherever you want it. So nice and easy. Now from there, I am going to go into the color editor to the advanced tab. And I'm going to try and pick an area. Oh, I don't want the blues for sure. Should have done it before I actually color graded it. Uh, <laughs> uh, but let's. <laughs> let's change this luckily you can drag this around which is cool um, I'm just going to reduce this color range a little bit right here there okay and then I'm just going to change my hue and saturation a little bit so I'm going to increase my hue um, I'm going to desaturate that a little bit I think this is the fastest I've ever done an edit like this, David. <laughs> and I just <laughs> lined it up just a touch. <laughs> Tell you, we're improving your productivity. <laughs> it's scary. It's making me sweat. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, so if we turn that whole color grade off, now you can see the kind of direction that I'm going with mm -hmm. this. Okay. And again, you can always take that down a little bit on the opacity if you wanted to. Wow, that's that's a that's a tough one, that, <laughs> isn't it? <laughs> have, have you run out of layers yet? I should should add there is a sixteen layer limit on a yes. on um, um, in capture one. Sorry, that's purely because we're working on the raw data. You end up with uh, obviously a lot of computations going on between all the layers. So there is a a sixteen layer limit. So you must be close to that. I would think, Wayne. Uh, getting it actually we're only yeah. doing 13 in total so we're we're fine oh there we go <laughs> <laughs> so what i'm going to do i'm going to get rid of my color editor i'm going to go back to my exposure tab i just want to lighten everything a little bit uh with my curve uh, mm -hmm. again in my luma so i don't affect uh the color saturation too much so let's go about here for that one and i'm just going to lift the midtones a bit more pull them There, I think. About there. Oh, wrong one. Okay. About there, it'd be fine. Um, so again, just the luma on that one. Just wanted to just pop it ever so gently. See that difference if I click that on and off that layer? And again, I've changed the opacity of it so you can strengthen that or, or weaken it however you wish. Mm -hmm. um, and then this bird cage now is, is bothering me as well because it's a little bit bright. Now, normally in the studio, we'd put a net in front of that. Um, a net is just like a little, literally, like as it sounds, a net you put in front of the light and it doesn't diffuse the light, but it does um, uh, just stop the output power of the light a little bit and holds it back, um, which is good. It stops it being so overexposed. Okay, so I'm going to do the bird cage here. Um, let's just pull this down a little bit. Now, I'm going to use a luminosity mask on this one because it'll be easier. Right. So I only want to affect my highlights. So I'm going to come up to... Oh, he says his pen's drilled off. 
You like your Luma masks, don't you? <laughs> uh, what, the, what, what did you do before the Luma range tool was, was, well, was uh, just developed? brush, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> brush tool. Um, so that's all I'm going to do on that. So that's selected most of my birdcage area. Okay, and then I can come in with my eraser tool, make sure my pass, my flow is up, and then get rid of everything I don't want it to affect quickly, uh, which is all these areas. Um, and if I only want to affect the highlights, so I'm not worried about this shadow tone around here on the birdcage. I'm not worried about that at all. So I only want to affect the highlights, so I'm just going to take the mask off. I'm only going to bring the brightness down a little bit. Probably there, really. Um, and that's enough. So that's the before and that's the after. So it just kind of brings it in, in tune with everything else, lighting-wise a little bit, makes it very subtle. Mm -hmm. um, that's that one. That's all I'm going to do on that. As I said, very quick adjustment. And from here, I think really, now we've got the option where we can use our clarity tool to soften skin, uh, which which is quite nice. So let's just add our final layer. We'll do that as a field. A, a final we'll layer? I, d I don't believe it, Wayne. <laughs> <laughs> we've got that skin softening. <laughs> let's use that again. God, there's a lot going on here, David, for this webinar. <laughs> I feel like I haven't spoken to anyone. <laughs> apart from... um, now, yeah. the good thing is we can cheat with our mask again. So we can copy our mask from ah, any of, of the hair and face or the yeah. eyes and the skin and hands. I think, is the skin all of it? can't remember what was. Yeah, it is. Yeah, pretty yeah. much. So, so I'm going to copy the mask from skin. Yeah. Uh, I've called it skin siphoning, uh, not skin softening. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, and all this is doing is is basically it's, it's softening our skin tones. So obviously I'm not retouching any blemishes. Um, obviously the new Capture One Pro, if uh, anyone has seen that come out, has yep. the new... Um, Some interesting new additions. Yes, yes yeah. new interesting additions, um, yeah. which will help with a lot of that. Um, let's get rid of our curve, get rid of our exposure. We're not changing any of that. We're just going to use the clarity tool. So basically, I'm just going to smooth out some of this texture to make it suit the type of shot, that very Baroque sort of style, fine art. And all I'm going to do, instead of increasing clarity, which we generally do in shots, on young skin and soft skin, that can be mm. quite harsh. So I don't want that harsh effect, so I'm going to go the other way. So I'm going to come down probably to about around 30-ish. And let me just come in so you can see that. Okay, if I do a before and after just on the clarity alone. See, it's only softened it a little bit, but I'm also mm. going to take the structure down about the same just to try and balance that out. Okay. Gives you more this sort of renaissance look then, I guess, doesn't yes. it? Yeah. So that, that is the before and that is the after. It just gives it that little dewy sort of mm -hmm. softness effect in there. And that, I think, David, one, two, three, four, five, <laughs> eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen yeah. layers. <laughs> wow. Oof. So wow. let's bring our thumbnails back. Um, <laughs> I can already see with the, with the, um, with the color grade, um, yeah. I would spend more time in the color grade because if I go to the one I did previously, which when you try and reverse engineer, yeah. is very very difficult, very difficult. you can see that my yeah. lightness is different I okay mean, anyone will know anyone who's watched me do an edit and said oh i'm going to edit this it never um uh ends up in the same way it's, it's almost completely <laughs> yeah, impossible to right. reverse engineer what what you're doing but the important part is the is the process so yes yeah. indeed yeah 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 that's the process i mean I mean that that is uh, that's a lot to do, you know. Considering we were talking for the first part as well, that is a exactly. lot to do in a in a short space. Of time. Maybe we were a bit ambitious about what we were going to talk about. So. <laughs> <laughs> I I think that's 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 pretty good in all fairness. You know, yeah. I would lift it a little bit. Obviously, this is the one I've spent I've spent time on, and yeah. you can see it. I've I've picked my selection points for color grading in different places from my main scene. Yeah, and I've picked a couple of them. Um, and I've probably changed some of the levels a little bit to make things pop. You know, this is a very quick one hour. It's it's getting there, but obviously it's not as not as bright as this one, which yeah. means we would we would pull that up a little bit, pull the curves up a little bit in in a lot of those. I'll, I'll put up uh, on screen as well you, the two that you uh, sent to me yesterday as well. So because that's nice, nice big high resolution and everything. Yeah. So you've so got can, the warm looking. Can people the cold still see my well. capture screen? Hang on, no, I'll bring that back as well. Hang on. Okay. 
Uh, so I've, yeah. I've added those in for oh, people. Oh, you've added to those in. Okay, put them up. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So these were yeah. some of the other shots I did. So you notice uh, when I made the adjustments on this, I then carried on shooting with those adjustments on, apart from the eye mask and the skin mask and everything else. Right. But it means my main color grade came in on all my shots, which you can see that in that little behind the scenes. Oh, nice. If you see my monitor behind a chair. Yeah. All right. Um, so there's two versions of this. This is the, the version that you've just seen me edit, mm -hmm. and this is with the with the colder, bluer tone, the cool tone, as I call it. Um, now, this is post Photoshop, so it's had a bit more work done on it and taken out the hinge of the bird cage. Mm -hmm. And I have reshaped the head and the, the face a little bit here and mm -hmm. pulled the bell of the dress out as well on the bottom left hand side. Right, just to widen it a little. Yeah. yeah. Now, I know people in the fine art world are used to a more warmer tone, a Baroque sort of style warmth, and that is that version there, just with mm -hmm. a slightly different color grade. Cool. Okay, so we have the two final versions of that. Which one you prefer is Ooh, it's a your, tricky your decision. Own yeah. <laughs> <laughs> We're just going to take a few questions uh, for like well, I'll pick out like a, a mix of five questions. And again, if we didn't get to your specific question, uh, don't don't feel bad. It's just uh, between the three kind of locations we're broadcasting to. Um, it's hard to see everything at the at the same time. Uh, I'm sure you yeah. can appreciate. But on Facebook, YouTube, uh, you know, in the coming days, we we'll pick up some more comments to everything uh, as well. So, um, first question from Philip, who's in the webinar room, he says, "Is the mask display opposite to Photoshop? I.e., the red area would not be affected in Photoshop." I I haven't done quick masking in Photoshop for a while, but no. The, the the mask in Capture One Pro, the red area you see is the area that you're adjusting. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Okay, so that's a good good thing to to know. Oh, Eddie already answered that for us. Eddie, thanks. Ah, cool. <laughs> <laughs> um, <you. laughs> let's see. Uh, Daryl also in the webinar room. We've come over to YouTube and Facebook as well. Uh, great video so far. Thank you, Daryl. Um, Daryl. When would you choose to use the XT over your medium format camera for a shoot like this? Um, do you know that that's a tough question because I love shooting medium format and always have done since the film days so it's hard to get me out of medium format right um, but you know the size and the speed of the XT3 and 4 systems now and obviously for moving image with the XT4 with the 5 axis image stabilization in there and you know improved face and eye detection and, and everything else that's going on in there is phenomenal mm -hmm. uh, a phenomenal beast of a tool and everything's improving in that thing um, it's, it's quite scary how good it is uh, in that respect. Yeah. Um, it's quicker than I can be, for sure, you know, 100% <laughs> um, nowadays. Um, I still love image quality of larger sensors. Mm -hmm. So not so much about the megapixels, but I love the image quality of larger. It is different. And for people that shoot, you know, perhaps a DSLR and medium format um, or a, a mirrorless and medium format, you'll know what I'm talking about. The color range is different, the dynamic range is different, and the nuances between gradation of color tones and saturation is different as well. Yeah. It's a lot smoother. Yeah, it's just, uh, uh, yeah, there's something about the larger medium format sensor. Yeah. It, you know, on the 50 and the 100, it's just, yeah, it's something else. Yeah. yeah. Completely different, yeah. 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 Um, that's, that's a tough choice for me. If I'm shooting, say, you know, I don't know, a collection, um, and you're doing... 15 looks 16 looks mm. and you're shooting three looks per collection then that's a lot of images i'd probably go xt4 based on file size yeah yep. i wouldn't want 2000 raw no. files from a gfx 100 and if it's only going to live online as well that's also a consideration <laughs> yeah. and so yeah yeah <laughs> yeah that's right yeah speed and hard drive space for sure yeah <laughs> um, yeah god yeah um faran was asking could you combine the skin and the last skin softening one which you could i guess but then you'd be limited to the same opacity yes so, that's right yeah. yeah that's right it's nice to pick those those areas independently because you've always got the control to go back and adjust the opacity yeah of your brush tool um you know your overall layer but also change your opacity of your brush tool depending on what area of the yeah. scene you're it's, actually it, changing but it's definitely the kind of... control freak approach isn't it like for want of a <laughs> without being sounding rude but it does give you that ability to to go through yeah. the layers and really tweak each one in a very individual stylistic way so yes yeah, yeah. actually speaking of that on on the edit that we just did can you yes show it with all the layers off that was lee was yes, asking yes certainly can yeah let's just bring my tool panel back yeah so just um, do a before after on back the... let's go to 
No, it's not that one. There it is. Yes, I can. So uh, basically, go up to your reset. If you hold your Alt button yeah. and hold reset down, that is the image before. Before. And, and there is the after. Cool. Very Obviously, cool. Obviously, this one's a little bit dark compared to my original. This is this this one I've just clicked on. It was the original edit I did, and I yeah. numbered all my layers for you. As like trying to replicate color grading when you don't know your source point is really <laughs> really tricky. Um, so yeah, if you want to look at this one, this the one we've just done is a is a is a raw copy um, which we tried to replicate. But if I go to this one, you can you can see that mm -hmm. is the before and that is the after where we got to before it was then um, pulled out into Photoshop. Mm -hmm. And of course, once you do any retouching and shifting of dresses and things. Um, you c it comes back into into capture one as a PSD anyway, mm -hmm. so it comes back in once you've done your edits. Yeah. So good workflow back and forth. Definitely. Uh, Letterbox Dreams on YouTube. That's a good name. Good name. Uh, <laughs> was asking when using Lumity ma luminosity masks. Yes. It gets tricky uh, when you're trying to separate the subject from the background. Oops, it went away. Hang on. Um, the mask and sliders can be close but not quite there. Um, so don't forget for refining. That that so by default radius is at zero, so sensitivity will have no um, yeah. effect. Yeah. Mm. So you've got to boost your radius and then experiment between pushing it all the way to the right um, yeah. and all the way to the left for feathering. But all the yes. way to the right will definitely help you refine, sharpen the yeah. edge. Yeah. Yeah. yeah my, edge. My, mine was a very quick based on our time scale yeah. and how many layers <laughs> I had to get through. You've definitely seen the rough, rough version. <laughs> but also, you don't always have to be super accurate. So if you're doing, an, like if Wayne's background was really bright, you could have done a super rough mask on the, the dress and then use the black slider or, or a curve. And then because you're targeting that tonal range, it doesn't matter that the mask is sloppy because the edit will only affect that particular tonal range. So yes, there's there's that to remember as well. Um, let's see. RLC Cuba said he was learning a lot today. Thank you. That's good. Thank you. Been a pleasure. Appreciate. Sorry it was so rushed, and sorry if I was talking at three hundred miles an hour. No, no, people. no. It was, it was, it was a good pace, definitely. So it was, <laughs> it was longer than we anticipated. So much yeah. so that the light is now dying, or the battery is now dying on the, <laughs> on on my light. So that's why I'm looking a bit gloomy uh, over here. Um, Let's see. Uh, Mark says, brilliant talk. Thanks to both of you uh, Thank from you, Manchester, UK. Thank you. Um, and Nick says, so helpful to watch this portrait evolve and the techniques just cancelled my Adobe subscription. Woo! <laughs> Good man. <laughs> perfect. Perfect. Thank, thank you very much uh, for that. And Ken was asking, um, Let's see, do you, I'm not quite sure if I fully understand, uh, do you level the exposure white balance first before you retouch a set of photos or do you edit on each yes. photo subsequently, I guess? No, that, yeah. that's, in, that's in our first, first layer, that would be global adjustments. Normally yeah. I would do it on the background layer, but mm. just for the purpose of this webinar, I've, I've just put a layer in and called it global adjustments, yeah. Nice one. Yeah, so yes, I would do those basic exposure, contrast, um, shadow and highlight adjustments and curve tool um, to start with and my white balance, which I did shift at the beginning of this of this webinar. Yeah. Great. There we go. I think okay, um, as again, apologies if uh, uh, we didn't get to your individual questions. Um, but as I said, this will live on on Facebook, on, on YouTube and then yes. any comments that arrive after that. Sometimes YouTube uploads the live chat. Sometimes it doesn't. Uh, it's a bit <laughs> hit and miss for some reason. Um, but we can always go back and field comments um, at a late later yep. date as well. Um, and on, on top of that, people can always, if they've got questions, Fujifilm mm -hmm. XT4 or Capture One Pro, mm -hmm. I'm more than happy to answer them. They can always send their questions into me on my email on my website if they want to get through and contact with me there. Um, and for those that are able to, there will be, you know, when we get out of lockdown, there will be Fujifilm workshops where yes. I will be doing and live the... workshops with XT and GFX cameras so you can come and play. And I've got to say apology to everyone that doesn't have XT4. You won't have the classic NEG film simulation yet. Ah, <laughs> <laughs> is yours a special one? I <laughs> well, no, it's not in XT3 yet. Ah, uh, right, right. Any other ones, I'm hoping there'll be a firmware upgrade. Yeah, but, um, yeah. And yeah. I guess uh, hopefully after this... Uh, don't forget there's the Fuji House of Photography in London, if you're in the yes. UK, which is a great spot to, to visit. 
as yes, well indeed. if you ever happen to be in London uh, do pass by and um, check that out so um, that's a, a great space yeah yes and um, if you want to see some more XT4 editing on May the I can't remember which date it is but if you check out our Facebook live uh, schedule I'm going to edit an XT4 shot from Hong Kong so a nice architectural shot with a few layers not 13 um, but <laughs> a couple of layers <laughs> um, and perspective correction and a few other bits and pieces so keep yes. an eye on our Facebook events and then uh, you can come back and watch that if you're interested in Fuji and actually also uh, later on in May I'm going to edit a GFX 100 shot from Russell Lord. he's one of your fellow uh, ex-photographers in Australia does surfing mm -hmm. pictures, waves, water great stuff, nice. so more Fuji content nice. coming and Capture One content uh, if you're interested so there we go nice Perfect. one, thanks Wayne uh, thank thanks, you. thanks thank for you joining everybody. us and showing us your workflow and being flexible with uh, changing from our original plans of doing it all in the same place and everything. <laughs> That's so, fine. But just, yeah. just shows yeah. what you can do when there's a challenge. <laughs> Love a challenge. You know, no special props, no stylist, no nothing. No nothing, no, exactly. And a bird cage from my, from my entrance hall. Yeah, and paid in <laughs> chocolate and goodwill, I'm sure. Yes, yeah. indeed. <laughs> <laughs> nice one. All right, Wayne, thanks a lot and uh, thanks thank to you. everyone for joining and... See you all guys soon. Take care. Thank you. Thank Thanks you, everybody. Wayne. See you. Bye now.